Good afternoon, brothers and sisters in Christ. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Thanks, guys. So a very warm welcome to this afternoon session. It's a cozy one on youth, spiritual sense and sense. I am Audrey, and with me... My name is Kev. Nice to meet you, everyone. So very good afternoon to all of you, and um, we'll do a short introduction of ourselves, and um, hopefully today will be one that's fruitful, and if you have any questions, uh, any inspirations that come up for you, feel free to hold it in your heart, and we can address some of them towards the end as well. I go first? Sure. Okay. So nice to meet everyone. My name is Kev. Um, uh, as the slide shows, I'm an accountant. Is what I went to school for, is what I've been training to do, and it's been my career pretty much since the start. And um, like every stereotypical accountant, um, I would tick all the box for you, right? So um, I'm very about dollars and cents. I'm very about numbers. It's very intuitive to me. It's a, a big part of my work. And I'm someone that I can look at numbers and probably be able to tell the story behind an organization or a transaction or a deal or how things went wrong, just looking at a set of numbers. Um, so that's a little bit about my background, and um, I think it's molded a lot into the person I've become as well. Um, very black and white, very logical, um, because one plus one gives you two. And um, that's kind of the background of where I've come from. And from a faith perspective, I'm a cradle Catholic, I'm born into a Catholic family. And I'm um, considered it one of the biggest gifts ever that I've received. I'm born into a family full of love and faith, and now forming my own family and passing this faith down. And every day still feeling very grateful um, about this amazing gift that our family can share with one another, with fellow brothers and sisters. And um, yeah, I'm thankful for this gift. And I've popped down board member as well. Um, so I'm a board member of the Catholic Foundation, uh, along with other sort of other worthy causes that I believe in. And um, it was through my involvement in Catholic Foundation that I get to learn what Catholic Foundation is all about. And hopefully throughout the course of today, I can share with you a little bit what they are, what do they do, why they're important uh, as part of our universal church. And importantly, through the involvement, I've learned that my contribution towards my church is not just a couple of dollars that I drop into the offering bag. It can be in the form of my time. It can be in the form of my professional capacity. So I look at the financials of the foundation. I look at the complicated financial matters of the foundation. I obviously contribute my time in different ways. So i um, feeling very rich in the sense that I'm not limited by just my financial resources. It's also my time. It's also my talents. And this is a big part of, I guess, the overall stewardship concept. And I guess you guys must have read the brief before coming to today's talk. So it's a series of talk organized by the foundation, centered around stewardship, centered around what does it mean for us as Catholics, centered around what does it mean for the church, and centered around what it, what it means for us as individuals. So hope to get to know you a bit more through this session. And um, I would like you to get to know more of my friend, Audrey. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so for me, um, I'm Audrey Joy. My primary identity is as a child of God. In fact, that's all our identity as children of God. So that's my first and primary vocation as a woman. Um, and sometimes it's very easy to get swayed in the world and I forget my own identity also. Um, I'm also a wife. This is my husband, Gerald. Um, we are both uh, entrepreneurs. We got married about five years ago. Uh, I'm probably similar ages with uh, some of you also. Uh, I don't look my age. Um, <laughs> a little bit uh, older also than I look. Um, and um, as an entrepreneur, um, this is my personal vocation that the Lord has called me to. Um, and part of the personal vocation involves doing work in financial education and financial emotional resilience for young people, children, and families. And um, I'm also a creative. I, I'm a musician, trying to be wannabe <laughs> musician. <laughs> and so I see the creative arts as a way in which God ministers. And I hope today's um, sharing from us will give some inspiration also about how God can fit in this conversation around money, right? Because oftentimes, 
money, money matters are things that we put at a little corner. But hopefully through our sharing today, we can also share a little bit about how God has been so present in our own money journey. Okay. So we are going to uh, sit. If that's okay, we'll come a bit nearer to all of you. Um, and hopefully this will be one that's um, interactive and fun as well. Um, first things first, as we were praying for this session, right? Asking the Lord, what do we talk about when it comes to this aspect and this area? And in my work in doing this money education for young people, the first thing that the Lord said to me was actually to bring Jesus into our daily decisions. And it sounds very you know, big, but at the same time, what I feel that Jesus is inviting us to do is to bring him into all aspects of our life. And uh, sometimes you don't think that money is an aspect that, you know, Jesus can be very present or the Holy Spirit can be present, you know, because God is faith. But actually in the context of how we use our wealth, how we manage decisions and make discerning decisions, this is where the Lord can be very present. So we have a choice, you know, accept or reject. And, you know, it's a daily struggle, right, for us in the various aspects of life. Life sometimes is not necessarily very easy. We all have our little crosses that we have to bear. But the good news is that we are not alone. And something that I learned recently is like JMJ, Jesus, Mary, Joseph. You can actually call out to Jesus, Mary, Joseph to assist us. And how, how does that actually come about, right? What are the concrete areas in which we can make this discernment with the Lord? Okay, so this aspect of discernment, right, and big and small decisions, one thing that I learned in my work at Play Mula is this aspect of what we call money narratives. Okay, money narratives are essentially the scripts and the stories and the things we've heard about money being passed down to us by our grandparents or even our parents. So a money narrative could look something like this, right? Money is the root of all conflict. Money is the source of all evil. Money is a tool for a flourishing life. Money can make or break friendships, right? So you realize that for each of us, we have very different scripts. We have very different narratives that are unique to us. As I was also preparing for this session, what I felt the Lord say also is that, you know, money and the money journey and the discernment journey of making good financial decisions is one that is not a one-size-fit-all model. So what may work for your friend may actually not work for you. Therefore, the conclusion here is to invite the Lord to see how can he bring forth new money narratives. So I'll give you an example, okay? For me, in the past, money used to be security, right? Money is security. As a result of that, what actually ended up happening, the unintended consequence is that I ended up hoarding things, <laughs> buying a lot of clothing, buy a lot of things that I would end up regretting because why? My self-worth at that time was tied to looking good and having things of so-called worth. So those were the scripts, right, that I grew up with. And for me and my family, we came from a very humble background. And so this sense of security was tied into money, right, or to things. And what I felt the Lord do almost 10 years ago when I experienced my own conversion journey was undo some of these scripts. And you know, from a faith perspective, it's the lies that we've been told or the lies that we've unconsciously adopted. Right? And sometimes it's very insidious, right? Because you don't question these narratives, you don't necessarily question these thoughts that you unconsciously inherit. But the good news is that in our big and small decisions, the Lord can give us new scripts, new narratives, and new truths. So a new truth for me today, you know, at one point I was like, money is a tool. But money is a tool for what? What purpose? It's, so, it's also so simple, right? Money is a tool. It sounds like it's very good. But I felt the Lord challenging me to say, money is a tool for what purpose? And that was when I realized what it was, was money is a tool for a flourishing life. But that required me 
to then discern what is the version of the flourishing life. And in our faith, you know, from John 10.10, 10, the abundant life that God has called us to. And the flourishing life for one person may be so different from another person, right? For me, a flourishing life for me is that, you know, I at some point don't have to worry about money, that I have invested my money in a way that can work. A flourishing life may be something that allows me to have freedom to do what I would love to do. And so as this journey, you know, that we take today, I invite you to also think about some of these scripts, right? What are some of the narratives you've heard? And the good news as Christians, as Catholics, is that we can bring this to the Lord in prayer, right? And of course, you know, like in, in the work that we do, we go through a whole programming around this, but we all have the opportunity to co-create the Holy Spirit, what that new narrative can begin to look like. Yeah, actually I feel a bit prompted. Huh? Maybe, Kevin, what, what do you feel when you think about money and what are some of the narratives you've heard for yourself? For me, in the past has been, to some extent, equating money to success. Because um, as a young kid, you go to school and your duty is to do well in school and that equates to a good result. And then further on, it's getting to a good university, getting to a good cause. So I equate it to success. And then at a point in time, it seems to be the measure of success is how much I'm earning as a professional and as a career. And that's probably my mindset for a huge part of my life. And that was so, so wrong. Because uh, you tell yourself that can't be the only measure of success. But at the end of the day, when you look at the lifestyle that you're having, when you look at how much you have compared to your peers, you, I think it's that broader environment, you know, that broad environment seems to nerve it in that direction, and then you get sucked in as well, saying, oh, maybe that is one measure of success, because it's very quantitative, and that's, that's I think that's one of the pitfalls. <laughs> this is not giving accountants a good rep, but that's one of the pitfalls being accountants. You get so scientific about it, because everything can be measured by numbers. Even today's times, we're trying to measure the impact of climate change. We are trying to measure carbon emissions. Everything can be measured. So this is the accountant in me, you know? And then, so I think in direct answer to the question, Audrey, I think at that point in time was, I think how much I'm earning and how much I have is a measure of success. But over time, I've learned that that is actually you know, not just detrimental to my own well-being, that's probably detrimental to my family mm. and maybe detrimental to my children as well because I wouldn't want them to measure their own success in that way. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think you know, th what you mentioned is also thinking and listening to the narratives that surround us, right? Because we may inherit narratives from our parents, but actually society, the media, like social media, these are all narratives that come that allow us to really question. So one of the things we hope to leave you today also is, you know, questioning some of these narratives that we may have unconsciously adopted. And so what I'd like to do at this juncture is also share a personal experience about how, you know, God has been very present in the discernment and the decision making and also share a bit about, you know, my own journey. Because our God is a very specific and very concrete God, right? He's very present in our lives. The question sometimes is whether I can see where he's present or where his hand is present, right? And so this example was uh, when my husband and I first got married, you know? And that was about the time when we were also beginning to question and shift our money narratives, right? Because if the narrative is money is for security, then actually, to be honest, when we first got married, we tried to ballot for a home, and guess what? Like, we didn't get a place. And we were challenged at our point of marriage to one, see whether we would actually rent. And if the narrative is money is security, money is for, you know, for security, we wouldn't rent. Because it just completely didn't make any sense to rent. And so we, we felt, we prayed, and then we discerned, and we said, okay, we'll rent, right? And it was very unconventional in that sense. But at that time, we were very specific with God too. We said, Lord, you know, we need a home, right? So please give us the grace and the wisdom. And we told Jesus, we said, we have four criterias, okay? And Lord, please help us. We said the first criteria is that we want a home that is near church. 
Second criteria, we want a home that is near adoration. This is CSC, la, so you can imagine I'm an Alkang girl. The third criteria was, Lord, do we want to stay near our parents? And the fourth criteria, I said, Lord, please green. Okay, because urban city, very hustle bustle already, right? But, you know, give me green. And we prayed this prayer, and we went around Alkang as a couple, but we went into homes, and it was very strange, you know, I kid you not. The house was like dark, Another house we went to, the front door was burned. Another house we went to, there was a large, you know, grey altar. And after a while, we were like, wow, our, it, it fit our decision criteria, but it did not fit our budget because it was a resale property. But it didn't feel peace. So we said, okay, we'll leave it. Second time we went again, we said, okay, Lord, this is still our criteria. Can we find something? Second incident that happened, so can you imagine we've been married now for almost like uh, two years, right, when this, this happened. Went into another place. The criteria was somewhat close. It was near his parents. But what actually ended up happening was that, you know, there was disagreement on buying this particular place. So we realised that, yeah, kind of fit some of the criteria, two out of four criteria, but there was no peace. So we, we, we realised that, okay, our parents are wise and that we should listen to them and the property should not be a source of conflict. So we say, okay, never mind. So this is like third year. Then we say, okay, God, we're going to try and ballot again. Ballot again. We got a place in some, around the Protong Pase region. We did our budget, but it was not near church, nor adoration, not green. When we went in there, we realised that the property had actually um, was like facing a multi-storey car park. So it didn't really fit our criteria, right? And then again, we realized that, oh gosh, you know, this is our third year already in marriage and we're still renting. And we said, you know, what do we do? So we felt very dejected and very disappointed. And can you see, right, the discernment journey is one that sometimes it's not just like a year or two years. It takes time. So we brought back into prayer. We felt we were not at peace. We said, no, Lord, you know, we're not going to go ahead. Okay, fast forward the story. Um, five years, almost five years later, our uncle told us to go and ballot at this place. Um, and we got the ballot number. The ballot number was 23. And a very dear friend of mine told me, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And you know what? It's near green. It's near church and adoration. It was within our budget. It's in somewhat distance from our parents. Five years, brothers and sisters. But you know what? Our God is so faithful. And that was when I realized that, you know, when we are clear with our decision-making criteria, God will outdo in his abundance. And like in the verse in Corinthians, it says, For no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the mind can conceive what the Lord has prepared for those who love him. And this was when I realized that, wow, you know, Jesus, you are so present in our daily decision-making, in the big and small decisions. Whenever I hear Audrey share, I always end up with, Audrey has Jesus on her speed dial. I always come to this conclusion. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. We all do. We all do. And, you know, I just wanted to share this from Christe Fidelis Lachi. This was um, the call of the laity for all of us, right? It says, to be able to discover the actual will of the Lord in our lives always involves listening to the word of God and the church with a fervent and constant prayer, recourse to wise and loving spiritual guides. And I think this really sums up, you know, this whole thing around spiritual sense and sense, right? Because if money is a tool for a flourishing life, for some of us in the audience, it may be to further studies, for some of us maybe to get married, for some of us it may be to do our own business, Sometimes when God plants these seeds in our hearts, they're actually His will. And the Lord wants the best for us, right? But it also involves listening to the Word of God. And I think for us, praying with the Word actually encouraged us during the tough times. Right? The second also is around you know, having wise spiritual guides. We have good friends in our community, uh, Vokari, who really encouraged us through the journey and encouraged us to say, okay, you know, if this decision is causing no peace, Right? then it's okay. We don't have to take it forward. 
And finally, you know, um, I'll just leave you with this verse, which was actually from Gerald's and my second reading um, from Romans. And it says, Do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what's God's will in his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And so one thing that I've learned is, you know, this journey of life sometimes may be very challenging it may be somewhat unconventional we may not follow the path of you know the the standards of the world but the good news is that you know god is always on our side right and something that i love from saint john paul ii you know he always says that we are unique and we are unrepeatable all of us are unique and unrepeatable so even in our own spiritual journey one thing that i've also learned is you know the five pillars of money um, so it's saving, spending, earning, giving, and investing. Money is not just spend and save, right? So if you see the five pillars of money, it's really what Kevin was saying earlier about stewardship. Suddenly we can begin to see money in a more holistic way. And one of the frameworks that I'd love to share with you today is the eight forms of capital. So financial capital is just one form of capital, but there is also cultural spiritual, intellectual, experiential, living material. And so when we begin to reframe wealth in this light, in permaculture, then you suddenly realize that, you know, money is just one form of capital, right? But the abundance and wealth and how we steward our wealth according to the five pillars of money essentially can help us to be good stewards and to use our money in a meaningful way. Okay. Over to you, Kevin. Big shoes to fill now, because obviously she's the subject matter expert on <laughs> anything money. Um, but really all I can do is to share a bit of my um, personal experiences. Uh, you know, I was once young. <laughs> I was once like you, uh, thinking about what I'm going to do with the rest of my life, thinking about what I'm going to do with from a money perspective, thinking about what I wanted to achieve in my life. And... Um, so I really have only three simple points, and I've broken them down to past, present, and future. Um, so in the past, and I've shared a little bit uh, about my past, and this is for a very, very vast majority of my life, or about 30 years of my life. Um, you know, I felt that I was doing good. I felt that I was a great Catholic. I was going to church. I was contributing in my small ways. When offering back comes along, I drop my couple of dollars. I feel that I don't sin. Um, so I feel like I was I was doing very well and I was you know feeling very pleased of myself and you know I go to Sunday schools I learn about all these things I contribute in in some ministries and I was learning a lot of scriptures as well um, and I could rattle them off you know I've heard people talk about them so I felt that I have lots lots of knowledge um, but on reflection I think all these knowledge stopped at my head probably none of them really reached my heart. And when it doesn't reach my heart, I think it doesn't really manifest fully and completely in my life. Um, so I put down a simple sharing like, um, so this is from the Acts, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Um, very simple phrase. Uh, there are similar phrases in our Chinese language and our Chinese culture. Shi bi shou gen yu fu. Um, so it's something that everyone talks about, something that everyone knows how to rattle on. Um, obviously, I know um, f through the reading, but I wasn't um, practicing it from my heart. You know, I was contributing in my small ways, felt that I was really giving, I've really ticked the checkbox, I've done what I'm supposed to do. Um, and another scripture is about um, having faith, trust the Lord, He knows what's best for you. And um, uh, a simple example was, you know, through my education, through my career, uh, I worked very hard. And, you know, if I achieve my goals, I give myself a big pat on the back and say, well done, Kev. You know, you've achieved your goal. Um, and when th and, and the, 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 the downside of that is when things don't go my way or when I don't achieve the goals that I set for myself, I end up beating myself up tremendously and say, why did it not turn out the way I planned it to be? Why did it not 
uh, why is this not the end goal that I've envisaged for myself? Um, so I had to learn the hard way. And it's a very simple way, uh, which is, you know, I'm not allowing God to take control of my life. I felt that I was God. I was controlling my own life. You know, I put in one, I get one back. Well done. This is the formula. One plus one is always two. Um, but I think where I failed to realize is, well, what about the situations when I put in one, I actually get two back? I fail to reflect, where did the additional one come from? Why am I worthy of the additional one? Um, so, so that's when it was a very big moment where I realized that oh, I wasn't at all a good Catholic. Um, and my whole mindset for 30 years of my life, which I was very happy about, uh, was completely not what I wanted to be or where I hoped myself to be. Um, so that was a big point in my life. And, and, you know, 30 years of my life was the vast majority. That's how I've been living my life, feeling good about myself in a false sense. <laughs> and, um, and through that as well, you know, when things don't go the way I want, when I put in one, I only get half back. I started to have the discernment and the reflection. Okay, perhaps the goal wasn't the right goal for me. Or perhaps I was too fixated on this single one goal that I deemed to be the definition of success that I've neglected or deprioritized an important aspect that I've overlooked. Or maybe I've refused to look. And I think through that discernment, then I slowly realized that I think this is where God wants me to be and what God wants me to learn. So that was a big part of my life. And you know, through the past, from that turning point, um, I should probably navigate this. So this is the present where then I said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of that will be given unto you. Um, so then, an example of this would be probably COVID, right? It's taken over the world, it's taken over our lives, it's taken over the way we operate, every aspect of our lives. Um, and when COVID hits, it was tremendous uncertainty, it was tremendous fear, particularly for businesses, because we have cash flows to think about, we have staff and their families to care for, we have a business to run. There was a lot of fear, and businesses were all scrambling, what do we do now? Are we going to be able to survive the next three months, six months, a year? What's going to happen? Um, so there was a lot of fear, but ourselves as a family unit, uh, so incomes were coming down naturally, um, but ourselves as a family unit, what we ended up was we actually gave out more than we have ever done before in our 30 plus years of our lives. Um, we ended up donating more. We ended up giving more. And um, there was this moment where I think this was where we turned into dusk on orange and everyone was scrambling. The shelves in the groceries were all empty. It was so much fear. Um, and finally, we got a big box of vegetables and fruits. And then, you know, by then when you see vegetables and fruits, right, it's like more precious than gold. <laughs> so we were so happy we had this big box. Um, but what happened that night was we ended up driving part of that big box of vegetables and fruits to some of our relatives. And then the whole way I was like, why are we doing this? We worked so hard for this box of fruits and vegetables. Why are we giving them away to our relatives? And the whole way I was just grumbling and mumbling and not the happiest camper. And beside me was my wife. And um, she said, this is the right thing to do. Um, our relatives are old. They should probably stay at home. They shouldn't come out um, to, be, to, to be buying some of these produce for themselves. And that's what we did. And um, so that's the biggest difference between me and my wife, right? I'm like, think and think and think and think. What about this? What about that? What happens if we do that? But what happens if it goes really wrong? And I'll think about 25 different times. And I'll be like, let me think again. <laughs> Whereas Jess is very... Um, too late, I've already given. <laughs> and that happens. And, and that's probably how we ended up donating a lot more than we used to before, because I wasn't given a chance to think. Uh, we'll be like, can we think about this? No, I've donated. And I'll be like, oh, oh. <laughs> so that's how it happened. And there was a big learning through COVID. And um, actually, 
the more we gave, incomes were there, incomes were doing well, and um, we felt that we have gained so much more than what we've given in. And through this, we start to ask ourselves, you know, um, why, what have we done to be worthy of more than what we already have? Um, and this is where the accountant in me sort of take a back seat a little bit. Um, one plus one does not always give us two. Because when God takes over, no math or no sums or no logic can explain a lot of these things. And um, so that's currently where I am at now. Um, sort of like focus on God, focus on kingdom. If it's the right thing to do, I'm going to charge forth. And I will have fears, I will have doubts, I will have certainty. Um, but that's when my faith takes over. And my God shows me that fear not. You know, it's a little to give now. I'm going to give you a lot more later. And even if I'm not going to give you as much as you have hoped for, I'm going to explain to you why, and I'm going to show you why. And that probably brings me to my future phase, whereby, and this is Jeremiah, which I've spoken a little bit about earlier about. Um, you know, for he knows the plans that he has for you, plans to prosper you, plans not to harm you, and plans to give you a hope and a future. That's not to say that things will be smooth sailing from here on out. And certainly that's not going to say that incomes are going to skyrocket. No, that's not going to happen. I know that. Um, but I have comfort that no matter what happens, um, I'm going to be able to deal with it. I'm going to be able, I'm going to have my family to journey with me. I'm going to have my friends to journey with me. And most importantly, I'm going to have God by my side. And I'm going to be able to ride it through. And in that... Um, what I start thinking about is, how do I begin with generosity for each and every single of my vocation? So as a son, as a professional in my firm, as a husband, as a father, as a brother, as a friend, or even as a stranger on the road, how can I begin that with generosity? So how can I be, how can I be a generous friend? How can I be a generous brother? How do I be generous to my parents? Um, so start having that simple mindset and it will help sort of shape my decisions, my actions, and my thinking. And that's something that I'm pondering a lot about. And I think it's beginning to shape slightly a different path, but I think a more fruitful path for me. Okay. And um, I, I promise to share with you a little bit about Catholic Foundation um, and, 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 and how I became involved was just and I, we were on our beds one night. We were saying, with our kids being so young, we felt that we had lesser time to be spending at church. So we were like, how do we stay connected? How do we stay contributing? Despite the fact that we have to be home a lot to nurture and, and, and take care of our young children. And before we even finished this thought, I had a call the very next day saying, we have this position on the board of the Catholic Foundation. Would you like to learn more and would you like to give it a try? And back then, I have no clue what the Catholic Foundation is, but I'm very thankful that I've had this chance to learn about it because it's so rich. And I, I think I've shared a little bit earlier. I don't just contribute in money. I can contribute in my professional capacity. I can contribute in the efforts, I can contribute to bringing expertise when we have a problem at the foundation. But effectively what it is, is the fundraising arm of the church, right? And when you hear that, you probably think that, yeah, I contribute to the church, I drop some money into the offering bag every week when I go to Mass, and when there's a good cause, I contribute to, to it. Um, but that's not in the same way. Let me share with you what we fundraise for, right? We, uh, you, sorry, it's a very busy slide because they support and work <laughs> a lot of important functions within the church. So some of these icons that you see here, um, um, I think I'm going to try to stand up if that's okay. Um, so you have institutes like New Evangelization, so it's contributing about spreading our faith, spreading this huge gift um, to other brothers and sisters in this world. Um, it's about the Catholic schools, our young children. What are they learning about their faith? How are they growing and nurturing their faith? It's about Catholic families. So how do Catholic families grow deeper in their faith? How do they pass down the faith 
to the next generation is by the office of young people, all you good people out there, right? All the activities, all the faith formation, the very strong initiatives that you have, the network that you have, um, all these needs funding, all these needs support. And it doesn't quite come from the dollar that we drop in the offering back. Actually, majority of it doesn't come through that. It comes through the gift program that the Catholic Foundation runs. Um, what about our retired priests? They've dedicated their whole life to the church and his work. Who's gonna take care of them now? Um, grooming future leaders, leaders of the church, um, to lead us to spread this faith, to ignite and shine, which is our theme for this year. How do we ignite and how do we shine if we don't have resources? Um, and the digital church, right? All the online masses, all these talks that you're attending physically, but you'll probably be able to spread the word on YouTube and all the social media's platform is going to reach out in multiple folds. So all these good cause, um, who is supporting that? You know, previously I thought that, yeah, surely the church will take care of itself. Um, but guess what? The church will not be able to take care of itself without people like you and I. That's why the church needs every single one in this room and the church needs every single member on this earth to contribute in our own different ways. So we can contribute our time as volunteers. We can contribute our expertise. Our, you know, all of us come from different backgrounds. You have different interests. You have different strengths. We can contribute in those ways, and we can contribute in financial ways for sure, uh, to the extent that we are able to, and to the extent that God allows us to. Um, and so then, therefore, my giving uh, uh, and my whole concept towards worship was a lot enriched after getting involved and after learning more about the church. And I hope to share this with you today. Hopefully, you can spread the word. And I think it's easy to understand once you look at this why the church needs every single one of us. Let me figure out what the next slide is. Okay, God, money, and me. Um, so this is a bit of a... Um, uh, w quite good, which is why I want to share with all of you and hopefully all your friends and anyone on the social media that we can reach out to. Um, it's basically... In addition to this series of stewardship talks that we are, we are, we are organizing as part of SG2, Catholic 200, um, we're also having this course on financial stewardship. So, you know, in the context of, um, it's going to have, you're going to hear from a lot of subject matter experts, right? So these could be financial planners, these could be people uh, like Audrey from that subject matter expertise. You're going to have small group sharings without a doubt and practical exercises about you know, money and about our faith, something that we don't talk a lot about. And in fact, a lot of this is this avoid talking about. Um, so we'll cover topics such as, what does the church think about getting a loan, getting a debt? What does the church say about investing our money, multiplying and growing our money? How do I make um, good conscious decisions as it relates to savings, but in a spiritual way? Um, so it's going to touch on all these topics. I think it's about five week course, you see the period there, it will start very early in the next year, 2022. And obviously, further details can be found on the website or via the QR code. So please take down, share the good word. And the best thing of it all is this pilot run that we're doing uh, will be free of charge, right? Because we want people to benefit from it. We want people to learn it. We want people to spread the good word. Okay, with that, I might hand over to Audrey. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, so we have a couple more minutes left and we thought, you know, it would be really great to hear from you and if you've had any questions, any, any sharing, yeah, yeah. inspiration. Feel free to ask anything, yeah. Anyone has any curious questions? So my question is about how we decide maybe how much to give or how much to donate or how much which proportion of our income we should give away to the needy and to the poor. Because I think um, in the Gospels, you also see like the widow gives two cents, but it's way more than what the rich give because it's a greater proportion of what she has. And it's also her trust in God that he will provide despite giving away so much. So how do we decide the balance between like um, security, planning for ourselves, uh, having enough for our families, but also giving away what's needed? 
to the poor. Yes. Would you like to take that first? Um, for me, I just I don't know what the right amount is. So I just picked a number and I started with it. Um, so I think it's uh, pray about it, discern about it, discuss with your loved ones and start at a particular number. So that's how I started. And then over time I realized that, hey, still comfortable, still doing well, still coping well. And along the way I may be inspired to contribute to a particular project or to a particular cause. So I topped it up. So I think there is the recurring amount that I give every month because I feel that that's what I want to do. And then there are the ad hoc requests that comes along. And, you know, um, I think it's down to my sharing. Where I, I've realized that actually the more I'm giving, actually the more, so much more that I get in return. And then, then it's the learning about actually none of this money is mine. It's actually what God has lent me for this period of time. Because really, he can give me nothing. And, um, and, and so then, therefore, with all these extra, what am I going to do with it? Um, you know, I want to be able to meet God one day and say, God, you gave me X amount. This is what I've done with it. I hope you're proud of me. I think it's, yeah. Yeah. Um, so in the context of perhaps, you know, like planning, when we talk about the five pillars of money, right? Save and give, spend, invest. Sometimes you might even say, okay, 10 to 15% of my income, you know, I can give it away. Um, but one thing I learned from my Protestant brethren, which is really beautiful, is that, you know, when they are prompted to give, you know what they will do? They will ask Jesus, Lord, how much should I give in this season? And because the seasons differ, sometimes it could be, you know, a couple of hundred, sometimes it's just a couple of $50, you know. But I realized that, wow, you know, when you give, well, you can also consult Jesus, you know. <laughs> yeah. Speed down, speed down, don't forget. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I know our organizers are prompting us. Uh, we, we have the end of the time, but we just want to very say a very big thank you to you. I hope that you have some useful takeaways. Um, uh, any questions about the cost that we've just shared with you or anything about ourselves or about our program? And we're very happy to continue after this forum. Um, but please, we want to thank you and we wish you a very blessed day ahead. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.